Hello, David Snowpack here from Snowpack Games, and this is part 8 in a tutorial series about implementing rollback netcode in a game built with the Godot game engine. Last time we talked about input delay and how a little bit can be useful for eliminating rollback artifacts and interpolation, and how it can be used to minimize artifacts, support high refresh rate monitors, and optionally allow reducing the simulation FPS while maintaining a high render FPS to get an increased frame budget. It was one of the more in-depth episodes. This time, we have a much lighter topic, animation players. Godot's animation player node is awesome. It's one of my favorite features of Godot. I use it in almost every project, but unfortunately, it's based on time. And for rollback, we need everything to be based on ticks. However, the Godot rollback netcode add-on includes the custom network animation player node that extends animation player to advance on each tick and to rollback when necessary but it's still using time behind the scenes. Basically, each time network process is called, it just adds the amount of time that each simulation frame should take. So if you're simulating at 60 FPS, that means it advances the animation player by 16.666 milliseconds every tick. It would be really, really cool to have an animation player that really used ticks underneath, but that would mean re-implementing all the features of animation player, and that's just not something I wanna attempt at this point. Anyway, for this reason and a couple of others, you still need to be careful with how you use Network Animation Player because there are some things that you can do uh, with it that aren't rollback safe. For example, Animation Player supports method call tracks to call custom methods at certain points during an animation, but you should avoid using them for anything that affects gameplay because they are not rollback safe. Since we are still using time underneath, we're adding floating point numbers together, and due to floating point math imprecision, a method could be called on different ticks on different clients. This may be okay for purely visual changes, but if these method calls affect gameplay, that could make your game behave non-deterministically. Also, they don't automatically roll back. If you rewind an animation player, normal property tracks will also rewind the property to its previous value, but with method call tracks, there really isn't a reliable way to roll back whatever it was that the method track did. So avoid method tracks. Another thing you need to be careful about is resetting the properties that you change in an animation. So let's say you start an animation due to an event. For example, uh, your opponent getting hit by your shot starts a hit animation that gradually changes the tank color by animating the modulate property. But a couple of frames into the animation, the game rolls back, and in fact, it turns out that your opponent actually used their shield power-up before you hit them. So when re-simulating, the hit animation isn't started this time because it wasn't a hit, it was a miss. But if you didn't reset the modulate property somehow, then your opponent will be stuck with their color a little bit modulated just on your client. Now, there's two ways to solve this problem. The first is that you can put all the properties that you animate into state for that node. So when we roll back to before the hit would have happened, the modulate property would be reset too. Or you can make a reset animation, which resets all the properties that you animate to their default values. The Godot editor uses the reset animation to reset animated properties before saving the scene. And if you enable the auto reset property on the network animation player node, it will also always play the reset animation when loading state before starting whatever animation was saved in state, if any. This is nice because you don't need to put a bunch of things from your network animation player into code. You can keep all the animation stuff together in uh, the network animation player and it keeps these properties out of state, which may be helpful considering that many of them are floating point numbers and that could potentially lead to state mismatches. So let's return to our demo game and animate our bombs and explosions. It should be super easy. I've already copied the new bomb.png and explosion.png sprite sheets into the assets directory, overwriting the ones we were using before. You can download those files from the GitLab repo, which is linked in the description below. So first thing, we are going to open up the bomb.tscn. You'll see there's now a whole bunch of bombs here because now we're using a sprite sheet rather than just a single image of a bomb. So first thing, we need to click on the sprite and change the H frames to 10 because this says 10 frames of animation. Next, we are going to add the network animation player. 
going to create a new animation called tick for the ticking time bomb. We're going to set the length of the animation to 0.5, the snap to 0.05, and we are going to loop it. Next, we need to go back to the sprite, and we're going to add a keyframe for the frame property. So just click this little key plus sign here. When it asks you if you want to create a new reset track, press create. This will automatically solve the problem we were talking about earlier with needing to reset any properties we animate. So now we have the first uh, frame here. Let's advance the animation editor here to uh, 0 0.05 increase the frame to one, and then we'll just click the little add keyframe button until all of the frames of animation are in here. All right, and now if I press play, it should animate our bomb nicely. Next, we need to go over to the bomb.gd script. I'm gonna add a new on ready variable for the animation player. And in the network spawn, right after setting the global position and starting the explosion timer, we are also going to start the tick animation. That should be everything we need to do for the bomb. Let's switch over to the explosion.tscn. Again, you'll see now a whole bunch of frames. Uh, we can get that back down to one frame by going to the sprite and changing the H frames to nine this time. And uh, we're going to make one additional change. We're going to go to the despawn timer where it's currently set to 7. We're going to increase that to 15 because it's a kind of long animation and we want to see the whole thing. So we're going to again add a network animation player, create a new animation, this time called explode. And we are going to set the length to 0 0.45 and the snap again to 0 0.05. Then we go back up to the sprite, uh, click the add keyframe on the frame property. Again, create the reset track. Oop, uh, for whatever reason, that created it somewhere towards the end of the animation. I'm going to drag that back to the beginning. We're going to put our position in the animation editor to uh, 0 0.05 and go back to the sprite, increase the frame to one, and click the add keyframe button until all the frames of animation are in there. Let's just go back to the beginning of the animation and play it to test. Yep, looks good. Then we go to the explosion.gd. Again, add a new on ready variable for the animation player. Go to the network spawn and play the explode animation. That should be everything we need to do. Let's run the game locally and see if it works. And move around, drop some bombs, which are animating perfectly. So that's all I have for you today. Please let me know if you have any questions in the comments below or on the Snowpet Games Discord or anywhere else that I am on the internet. Next time, we're going to talk about sound effects and how to add them in a rollback safe way such that they don't repeat every time the game rolls back. So subscribe on YouTube, check out snowpetgames.com for a link to the Discord and more information about me and my work. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.